giving you a voice. Making it loud our own way. Welcome, Welcome to, to the fun. fun. First updates now, FRC is produced in partnership with the Blue Alliance. Keep up to date on all live and archived FIRST Robotics events and team stats at thebluealliance.com. And by viewers like you. We need your help to keep fun at loud, live, and independent. Help us by visiting our Patreon to pledge your support at patreon.com forward slash first updates now. You can also support fun live on Twitch for a few bucks a month or by linking your Prime account for free and clicking subscribe. Welcome to the first official week of the first robotics competition in the Northeast. We've got your updates on events that you should be watching to start your season out right, and a recap on what we saw in our week zero events. Reporting for first updates now, I'm Audrey. I'm Kevin. And I'm Dave. Northeast is lucky enough to have our official week zero with a real field up in New Hampshire every year. So Kevin, can you tell us a bit about how the first unofficial matches of the year went two weeks ago? The official Week Zero event features a normal event format with both qualifications and playoffs, which makes it the best preseason event to see how the game is really going to function. What we saw was pretty awesome. Fast, effective shooting from up close, near full court shots that were making it in, low goal scoring being effective and useful. What we also didn't see has been indicative. Uh, no match had control panel points scored and very few teams had working climbers. One of the two teams that did successfully climb in qualifications seeded first, Team 1519 Mechanical Mayhem. They took 5687 and their full court shooting first overall. Having two of the best shooters and one of the only two working climbers, they looked poised to cruise through the playoffs, but that is not what happened. The fifth seeded 5962 was the other climber in qualifications, and they picked up two decent shooters in 1153 and 238. The semifinal matchup between the first and fifth seed shows how the volume of the fifth seed was able to beat the precision of the number one seed. In the second match, the top seeded Alliance scored half their balls in the three-point goal, but they only scored half the balls that the fifth seed scored, with three robots scoring. In the finals, the fifth seed met the third seeded Alliance of 40-41, 31-17, and 5-0-1. The third seed had two mid-range shooters in 40-41 and 31-17, and one robot that was feeding them while also hitting long shots from behind the trench in 501. That strategy proved to be really effective, and they scored 25 power cells in finals two, as well as getting a robot hanging to put up a whopping 146 points. And the third seed took it. Wow, that's so interesting how just a difference of what we usually see in terms of strategy, where the precision matters, is different than like the volume of strategy that we see. So. Let's kind of move into a discussion topic here of predictions of how this game is going to strategically really play out just from our week zero impressions. Like, is it going to be like three teams cycling, teams playing different zones or a mix or? I'm a little torn on this question. I think that both strategies are going to be viable for most of the season. We found that in week zero that playing the front court was actually pretty difficult where when you're cycling, you know exactly what you're going to do next. It's that little small advantage. Um, but I think over the course of the season, that might change. Yeah, so I still think that this is going to be a cycling game for the early weeks. Um, and then as we progress, you might see some different strategies of sort of the zone um, the zone game. As the season progresses, that strategy might evolve to be something more effective. But I think as we get into the start and teams, haven't really figured out the best way to help their alliance yet. They'll just know, uh, they'll just try and do what they've been practicing, right? So they've more than likely been sitting in their shop practicing running cycles and picking up balls and putting them in. So I think that uh, you'll see a lot of that in the early weeks. And then as you go throughout the season, it'll progress to more of a zone, front zone, uh, back zone kind of deal. Yeah, I think it's going to play more into a zone game. Just personally, from what I saw, I was up at Rochester Rally this past weekend, and I saw a lot of teams playing the back court where you get balls from the human player station and the front court where you get balls cycled from your opponent's human player station. 
Um, and there's only really two or three viable shots for robots that don't have turrets and adjustable hoods. So you have teams that can only really shoot from one place and balls that you can get from two places on the field. So I think those are going to play into each other pretty well for a zone game. Uh, going from chat, though, chat really doesn't think that it's going to be a zone game. Uh, Brennan McCaig says that um, they think it's going to be a cycling game for a very, very long time. Yeah, I could I could see that happening. I think just as teams uh, as they're going through their early events, they're kind of doing those cycles and getting into the rhythm of it, and then they just kind of stick with that strategy because they know what works best and are practiced with it. Mm. Yeah. So we're gonna Moving move on, on to the, our next section. Yeah, Kevin, take us away with top, top twenty-five. 25. Uh, who do you guys think could surprise us and make the top 25 this season? Yeah, so I got to give it in uh, New England, I got to give it at 3461. Over the years, I think these guys are relatively unknown, but we've had the chance to play with them uh, quite a few off season events and in season events. And every year, they've gotten incrementally better. Um, it's pretty impressive to me how they've kind of come from uh, just incrementally making changes and sort of stepping it up inch by inch and just not really overreaching too much. And every year they kind of pick something that's a little bit more aggressive for their ability, and then they tackle it and they accomplish it. Um, so I think that they're coming off of a final spot from Western NE last year, and they're definitely itching to get back in the finals and uh, take one. And this year they're rocking a turret and got a long shot. Uh, and they're not competing until week four, so they still got plenty of time to completely iron everything out and then absolutely run circles around the competition. Yeah, so I picked a very similar two teams for my sort of thing here. Um, I'd like to point out Team 1551 first, Grapes of Wrath, they're from around Rochester, and they've been getting progressively better and better throughout the years. Um, notably last year where... Uh, they were on the second seed at Finger Lakes Regional um, and hadn't really seen that kind of seeding since, I think, 2006. Um, but this year, I've, hearing, I've been hearing a lot for them. They And then I saw them last weekend at Rochester Rally. They have a long shot, a close shot, and a hang. And they finished early, so they have autos already, which is pretty impressive for a team now. Uh, they're one of the most prepared Rochester teams that I saw play this weekend, and I'm really excited to see them at FLR. Another Rochester team I want to point out here is 1126 Sparks. Mm -hmm. uh, they're a perennial Finger Lakes contender. They've got um, they've been pretty mediocre these past few years, but I think this year is the year that they break out. Um, and coming up for you guys, we have actually got a behind the bumpers interview that we're going to premiere right after this recap. So stay tuned for that. They've got an awesome tall robot with a turret, an innovative climb that looks really interesting, and it was really interesting to get up close with it. Sparks is a group of great people. Uh, I was a big fan of 501 on the winning alliance at week zero. Uh, they built their robot to make long shots, and they execute that really well. Uh, I haven't seen, but I'm really excited to see Team 870 Rice from South Old New York. They've been quietly putting together competitive robots since like 2014, but last year was their big break where they won both Finger Lakes and Long Island number two. This year they're headed back to the same two events, so we'll see what they've cooked up. Aha, uh -huh. cooked up like rice. Oh, uh, there you go. <laughs> All right, moving right along, let's jump right into our week one previews. Audrey, you want to take us, get us started with Granite State? Absolutely. So we're headed up to our first New England district event this week, and we've got the Granite State District event. We've got a few big names at this event, starting with an outlier in of themselves, Team 5687, the Outliers. They have a pretty impressive history when it comes to their first event and week one events. They have only lost one of their first events in their entire team history in 2016. That's four first event wins. And I predict that this year it will not be any different. They had an extremely strong week zero showing, and they're coming in as the team to beat. But there's a team that's looking to add some mayhem to that, and that's team 1519, Mechanical Mayhem. They're, they paired with the Outliers at the week zero event, but they lost in semis, and they're looking to improve that standing. But if we learn anything from 1519, their week zero to week one turnaround, uh, in 2018, they basically put their entire robot together in that time. They came with a chassis to the week zero and a robot with a turret to their first event. So 
they can do it if anyone. Other teams to look out for at this event are a lot of them, actually. We've got Team 319, Big Bad Bob, with their Big Bad Build Thread. They're sporting a tall, turreted robot that we've only seen in CAD so far. We've also got 95, you see right now. They've got a really pretty looking green and blue machine that we've seen practice at their shop. And they're ready to hop into the competition. Other teams to look out for at this event that we haven't heard from yet include 133 BERT. They're a perennial New England contender. Uh, team 1058, PVC Pirates, 131 Chaos, and 1729. Kevin also mentioned 501 earlier. They'll be playing here at Granite State as well with their powerful control panel shots. The Power Knights will fit really well in in this crowd. So it's going to be a fun event for sure. It's not a yeah, bit cold. Yeah, that's going to be crazy. I think that event's going to be completely, it's completely stacked. Yeah, it really is. All right, Dave, can you take us a bit more south to northern Connecticut? Yeah, so heading on down to a little town of Woodstock, Connecticut, we've got an event brewing that's surely bound for greatness. Traveling over the hills and through the woods of Connecticut, we've got some big name teams that are surely to come out swinging. This event may have been extra igniting this year as it's a new event and we've got teams 316 and 2590 coming up from New Jersey looking to steal a few district points from the from the pool. For local teams, we've got team 1153 who's already shown their shooting ability at the week zero event. Uh, if they can tune it in, they'll likely be a force to be reckoned with. After an upset in the finals, they've been they look like that they're going to be motivated to take it all the way in this event. Team 78 surely be the front runner and fan favorite of this event, coming off of a four banner season last year, where they were seated first in all three of their district events. Uh, I've gotten a few quick looks at their robot and no looks, but it looks like that they're going to be setting those balls pretty far and pretty high. Uh, my team to look out for at this event is Team 2170 Titanium Timahawks of Glastonbury, Connecticut. This team is yet to secure banner in their entire team history, but I think that's all about to change. Putting my super sleuth detective hat on, I was able to secure some leaks that are showing up <laughs> on the, uh, the screen here. Thanks, Bobby. Uh, with a quick floor pickup and a consistent, consistent fender shooter and a uh, solid hang, I think they'll make an, an awesome addition to any alliance. Uh, Oh, I feel like I might be forgetting something. I keep getting a bunch of messages in the corner. Something about a team 6328. Never really heard of them. Oh, well, let's just move on down to Hatsboro and Horsham. Take it away, Kevin. I think you could do something and mention 6328. Their mechanical advantage, the team that Dave is on, um, and they're really going to bring it. They have an awesome build thread. Check that out if you haven't. Um, they look really good so far, and I can't wait to see them compete personally. Yeah, I can't wait to see the robot move. <laughs> I was at the shop all night last night, but it's uh, getting there. Maybe maybe tonight. <laughs> It'll be fun, though. Hatboro Horsham is always a strong opener to the season in FMA. Multiple local powerhouses are coming to play this year, and it will likely be a very competitive week one. This event's hosted by 708 Hatters Robotics, who themselves look to have a very competitive robot this year. And they've been releasing updates on their YouTube channel, featuring a unique robot with a utility arm. Last year's number one seed and first overall pick are present. 2539 The Krypton Cougars and 1807 Redbird Robotics, as well as many of the usual contenders, such as 303 Testy, 341 Miss Daisy, 365 Mo. 1218 Vulcan Robotics, 1712 Dogma, 2607 The Fighting Robo Vikings, 3314 Mechan Mu Mechanical Mustangs, and 5895 Petty School Robotics. That's a Some lot of, the, of teams. Yeah, that is well. rough. <laughs> Hatboro's Hat stacked. Some of the best swerve drives in FMA are also showing up to this event. 103 The Cyber Sonics is again running swerve, and expect them to be quite competitive like they were last year. They have a very unique robot as they usually do with an intake on the one side and shooter on the other uh 1640 sabotage has also been very prof prolific this year posting content to their website they have an effect effective trench run robot with an adjustable hood that can shoot from multiple areas around the field and they're going to be a speedy cycler for this first event yeah apro sounds like it really is stacked this year that's that's a that's a lot. So of Granite State, check out I that mean, stream. yeah, Granite State really is too. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of these week one events are just they're the only week one event around. So you got all the teams who want to compete week one going up. <laughs> all right. Well, so I think 
in terms of these events for strategies, there's a lot of different teams who are going to be bringing out robots, but the strategy week one is going to be a lot different from the strategy week six. Yeah, How do you think that teams are going to adapt from what they put out this weekend to week six? Yeah, so just talking um, in terms of 6328, we did a lot of thought. Since we knew we were going to be week one, uh, we kind of tried to pick multiple strategies throughout the season since we're competing week one and then week five. So we got a whole month in between. So obviously there's going to be some crazy changes in between. Uh, I think now... I uh, don't see a ton of teams having polished robots at this week one event, even though there's no bag. Uh, I think that's saying that the uh, the project always extends to the time allotted, right? So even though teams have had extra weeks, they they might not be at the point that they wish they could be. Um, so I think that just having a robot that functions and can do play the game, uh, maybe not doesn't have to be at the highest level, just maybe doing some cycles and then get a nice hang in there, and uh, you should be good to go. I know we've been talking a lot about what do we need to make sure we have done for our first event in Week 3 um, versus what do we want to have by District Champs, say. And those two lists are very different, right? We want to make sure we have you know, bare bones functionality, we have a climb, we have this shot, we have that shot. Um, but by the end, we want to make sure that we can climb and balance with other people, we have more shots available, um, that kind of thing. Do you yeah, think, think we'll be seeing any double hangs this week? We already have. Uh, if you look at uh, results from Israel District 1, 10% uh, of the matches so far have had, had the hang with the ranking point. Um, Wow, that's a lot. Wow, yeah, that's, that's more a than lot. I thought that would be. Yeah. Yeah, I, I it mean, was surprising to me too. I thought you meant buddy climbs. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I was a little bit. Do you bit... think we'll see any of those too? Um, we'll see how the kids do at the shop tonight. Whether or not we get it <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Um, how, do you think we'll see ranking points from the um, the other one, the shield generator? Oh no. I don't, like, I think if you look at, so I watched a little bit of the Israel matches today, I don't think anybody ever touched it. I think that it's just something that uh, you're not seeing enough teams consistently scoring high numbers of power cells yet. So it's kind of not really coming into play and making a lot of sense. I think just solely focusing on getting as many points as you can and then uh, getting up a hang and getting that, like, that hanging ranking point, that, I think that'll be the one you see a lot more. I would be very surprised if we see... There might be some teams that specialize in the color wheel, but I don't think you'll see it a ton at all. So right now at Israel uh, Israel District 1, uh, Stage 1, which is scoring nine balls, has occurred in 27% of matches. Yeah, wow. See, that's... Stage 2 hasn't it's not happened. not a lot. <laughs> once. So, wow, yeah. I mean, if you, you think, think about it, um, at the Week 0, the winning alliance put up 25 balls. You need to put up, what is it, 29 balls 29, to reach yeah. stage two? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I just don't think that we're going to see that until like week three or week four. And we, then once you get some teams that have honed in their ability to shoot, uh, I think it'll it'll definitely be a lot easier. But now it's just um, so scattered with teams that have the ability to consistently put up balls that we're kind of, you never really see two of those robots on the same alliance, right? So it's really hard to, and then on top of that, even if you do, do you have any time to go do the color wheel? So there's a whole nother yeah. layer of it. Unless I think you by have district team. champs, you're going to be expected to get both ranking points. Yeah, I could see mm, the third yeah. the third robot and an alliance end up being like a color wheel specialist and a little bit of defense. Yeah, I could also it. see your, your full court shooter who sits over by the color wheel. The oh, yeah, yeah. The, they're the right there. They can go spin it. Zone. I want to yeah, see somebody shoot, playing a zone. shoot in, uh, and spin it at the same time. Somebody's got to do that. Yeah. That'd be cool. What do we think about defensive strategies this year? Are we going to see any? Are there going to be robots that play defense specifically? I hope not. <laughs> uh, as a, we built a short robot um we definitely made it so we have the ability to have plenty of covered covered shots but obviously if you have a robot that's 20 inches taller than you right you kind of you kind of uh leave yourself out in the open a little bit so i think the defense will come into play because i think there's a lot more short robots than i originally anticipated there being 
So once people start realizing that there is a, um, a gain in being able to be a defense robot that's tall and can easily block those short robots that can like only make shots from the initiation line or something, then you'll see a ton of defense that becomes extremely extremely effective but having the your um your protected zones and the trench and stuff like that it gets kind of tough and you give up like there's not a, a lot of high scores going up there so if you get in a lot of penalties from touching robots that are in the trench or bumping up against them when they're up against the driver's station those are going to add up and definitely you don't want to risk getting more penalties than you are scoring points it's not a good look I think I definitely see opportunistic defense happening. Like you have your uh, your third robot in an event can pick up balls and that's it, right? At some of these mm -hmm. shallow district events or early district events. They're back near your feeder station, taking balls from your feeder station, putting them into your trench or something like that, and yeah, hitting people that you. try to take your balls. Yeah, and definitely. then maybe they're bumping people that are trying to take shots that aren't protected, you know? Yeah, I would kind of say you saw something similar to that in 2013. I knew as a driver, you always had it in your mind that if you saw an opposing alliance kind of like running around and you could just kind of like tag them, tag them briefly to throw them out. If it wasn't going to cost you too much time, it was worth it to kind of to kind of bump them a little. But yeah. Yeah. Um, going from chat, Max5254 says... We're going to see lots of defensive autos, and I agree with that. Uh, we're going we're gonna to see a lot of uh, ball stealing from different sh sides of the field and people trying to get in the way of other people that isn't in your protected zones on the sides there. Did you say Max? He needs to get back to work. What is he doing watching? <laughs> <laughs> ah, he's got 52-54 in the name. He's not on your team. Yeah, yeah. Never heard right. of I, must be, I must be mistaken. Mistaken. Yeah, I think we're going to see defense on your long range shots um, and on your shots that are from the people who are shooting from the initiation line that don't have a protected zone or something to run up against. Um, I don't think we're going to see it much else because uh, basically we're just protected otherwise. Yeah. So that's about all the questions I have for you guys today. Uh, and that's all the week one events that we have to go through. So in closing... Here's your weekly reminder that top 25 voting will open on Sunday, and you guys better come out strong this year for that. Uh, you can also start submitting Twitch and short clips, not matches, to the fun Discord to make it onto Clips of the Week. And those will be due Monday, 6 p.m. Eastern Time. So that'll be all we have for you tonight from the Northeast. Thanks for hanging with us. Fun is once again asking for your help to stay loud, live, and independent. So please consider giving us a little bit of your support as a treat. You can join Fun Nation with a subscription or bits on Twitch. You can become a Patreon at patreon.com backslash first updates now, or really just letting people know that this is the place to be to get that fun information you and your team need. Check us out on Discord, Facebook, Insta, Twitter, and even here live on Twitch and our videos on YouTube. Right after this, we're going to show you that um, awesome behind the bumpers that we got this weekend with 1126 Sparks, so stay tuned. Uh, and you can also catch that after this on our YouTube channel. On behalf of myself, Ben, who's hanging out in the warmth of Florida tonight, Kevin, Dave, and our producer, Tyler, I'd like to thank you for tuning in. And thank you to all of our moderators in chat. Our next show is the Sweet Tea Recap. And we'll talk to you next week on the Nor'easter Region Recap. Go Blue! Thanks for watching. If you want more fun content, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos. You can also directly help support fun by visiting our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash first updates now or by subscribing at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Thanks to all of our co-executive producers on Patreon and tier two plus subscribers on Twitch keeping fun loud, live, and independent.